Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. If you've been with us the past uh, few weeks, uh, we've been going through a series, right? Back to the basics. And again, it's like super basic. Like it's not, there's nothing super crazy, but I pray that as we talk about some of the things that the local church that we're supposed to be about, I pray that, that we can learn something, that we can actually grow together, um, and that our community can become stronger as we go through um, these, these messages. And we're just going, going through Acts chapter two, uh, verse 42 to 47. I'm gonna read it. Um, we've read this, this, this portion every Sunday, but I think it's really powerful. And so, Again, this is in my Bible, it says the believers form a community, and this is what it says. It says, and all of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need and they worshiped together at the temple each day and met in each other's homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And uh, again, I pray that you know, as we've gone through this, it's been powerful, but we wanna really focus today on Acts chapter two, uh, verse 46, this is what it says. It says, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Really the focus of this is that first part, they worshiped together at the temple each day. So what we wanna talk today about is worship. What is worship, how we worship, why we worship, what does Jesus say about worship? And again, it's gonna be super basic, but I think, again, just going back to the basics can be really powerful when we just go back to the things that really brought us to Jesus in the first place, the, the, be, the beginning of the local church and what God was doing. And worship is one of the core aspects that makes up what we do as a church. And I was looking at some statistics this week about how distracted we are uh, in Canada and in North America, how distracted we are. And it's so fascinating to me. You might not know this, but on average, Americans, uh, they check their phones, their phones 344 times a day. And that's, that's a once every four minutes that we check our phone 344 times a day. You know, and then the, the average weekly time spent watching television in Canada, and this was from September 2021 to May 2022, was 22.2 .2 hours a week among adults aged 18 or above. And for those over 55, uh, their average television per week was 36.4 hours, average. So what that means is that on average, as Canadians, we're watching TV almost one day a week, full day a week. Now maybe you look at you like, yeah, I don't have time for that. And it's like, that, that might be fine, but this is average. Average time spent, and to be honest, now that we're in like playoff season for sports, I might be part of this statistic, right? Like, like, I don't, here's the thing, like, I like hockey, it's not my favorite, but I like it. As soon as playoffs come, I'm like, I'm a diehard Oilers fan all of a sudden. I like know all the players, I know like all the, the records being broken. And then I'm like watching basketball, like I like basketball, but I, again, I didn't watch a single game all season. Now I'm like, I gotta watch every single game, right? It's, it's odd. But 22.2 .2 hours a week on average, Canadians are watching television. And this, I found this, this statistic too, is that the typical working age internet user now spends more than two and a half hours per day on social media. Two and a half hours a day on social media. And what I find interesting is that I think that within the church, with those of us who follow Jesus, I think these statistics are probably close to the same. And what I also find interesting is that I think when I look at our landscape of Christianity, I think a lot of us, Sometimes the only time that we actually spend any time in worship is Sunday morning when we come together for maybe 30 minutes to an hour. That's the only time we actually spend in devotion and dedication and, and worshiping our king is only on Sundays for maybe 30 minutes. And I did a study 
They did a survey on Canadian uh, Christians, sorry, Christians in America, and only 60, 68% of Christians said that they prayed every single day. 68%. 32% of people said they prayed maybe once a week. And if, if that. So if you look at the statistics, what I'm seeing is that we have a big dilemma on our hands when it comes to what's happening in our society. We are very distracted by the wrong things. And we're also very busy with the wrong things. Like we're busy, like, like as humans. And you look at your schedule, like, yeah, I get it. We're busy as humans, we are. We're working a lot. Well, do you know what's happening though? Is because we've gotten ourselves so busy to trying to distract ourselves for entertainment, what's happened is that our relationships with Jesus, our relationship with God has actually gotten so poor and we're sitting back wondering why we're not hearing him speak. I think this is just the reality that a lot of us are, are facing right now when it comes to our relationship with Jesus is that we're so distracted, we're so busy that we don't have time to spend time in his presence. You know, if you go back to the Old Testament, they had, and even in the New Testament, right, Sabbath. You know, and a Sabbath was a day, at least in the design of it at the beginning, was designed to be a day of rest. And a lot of us, we don't have time in our schedules to even take one day a week to not be on our phone or to not be checking our emails or to not be working in our yard. or We don't have time for that. And so we're exhausted. And I want to tell you, this is what I truly believe. I think that if we were to dedicate more time and energy and get ourselves busy with the right things, we'd actually feel more energized and actually be able to work harder during the week as well. We have this huge dilemma on our hands because we sometimes feel so distant from God and we're wondering why and we can look in the mirror and realize if we're, we're feeling distant from God, most of the time it's my fault. The place that God is supposed to have in our life has been taken captive by our cell phones and our televisions and entertainment. And so what I think is happening and I don't think it's like consciously but I think subconsciously a lot of us is we're actually worshiping entertainment rather than worshiping our God. I truly believe this. And I get, and I get caught up in this too. Because how much time do you start a TV show and, and the way they end it, you're like, I have to finish the, the season. And so you end up watching like five episodes and you're like, wow, it's literally midnight and I have to be up early in the morning. And then we get to work, we're like, I'm so tired today, I didn't sleep well. It's like, no, duh. No, what, what a wonder we're so tired. You know, they were looking at, um, I don't know the exact statistics, but they were looking at the average amount of time people slept. And I think, and I could be wrong, but I think that in 1940, the average amount of time people slept was around like 10 to 11 hours. And now we're about seven hours a night. And again, those statistics might be way off, but the, the point is, whatever the statistic is, we're in a really tough place as humanity right now when it comes to rest and sleep and things like this. And I truly believe that if we want to kind of go against this, we have to learn how to worship. Life is so busy and so complicated that we often turn to the wrong things to try and rest and to try and cope. But I think as followers of Jesus, worship has to be something we value and we bring into everyday life. It says they worshiped together every day. It wasn't like they came together on Sunday, spent a 30 minutes in worship, and then went home and didn't have any sort of worship to their God the rest of the week. Every single day, they spent time worshiping. It was a non-negotiable for them. And then we're getting to a point in North America where not only has worship become non-negotiable, I think sometimes even just going to church has just, we've just kind of like, yeah, maybe I'll go. Maybe there's a soccer practice or something's going on. It's like, like we need to start to value the things that God has called us to do more in North America. I truly believe this. We need to bring worship back into a daily practice we have in our lives of corporate worship as well as private worship in our homes with our children and with our families. So I just want to go back to the basics of worship. And again, like, like you, you might not, your mind might not be blown, okay? I think Paul explains worship in the most basic form in his letter he wrote to the Romans here. And it says this in Romans 12, 1 to 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God 
because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. And then he says this, this is truly the way to worship him. So we want to go back, like, so basic, like, like, why do we worship? The question is, why do we worship? Because of everything he's done for me. Because of how amazing he is. You know what we don't worship for? We don't worship for a feeling. We don't, we don't, we don't worship so they can get an experience. We worship because of all he has done for you and all that he has done for me by sending his son and creating us and like the beauty of what he's done. We worship based not on how we feel. Now, yes, God can meet us in a place of worship in a powerful way, and we can experience his love and experience his goodness. We can experience him, but we have to not try and worship the experience. Because what happens if some one time you're in worship and there's no experience? You just sit back and be like, I hate this. What about me? It's like worship's not supposed to be about us. It's supposed to be about our incredible, loving God who, who loved us and gave himself for us. We worship him. We don't worship the feeling. We worship because of how amazing and beautiful and good he is. And even if the things around us don't make us feel like worshiping, have you ever had a moment like that? Like, I don't want to worship right now. My life sucks. When we go, we say, God, I'm putting myself to the side. And I'm putting you in your rightful place in my life. We put our phones away. We put our computers away. And we just sit and worship our king. We worship, and this is what Paul said. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. So that's why we worship. We worship because of what he's done, we worship because of how good he is and how amazing he is and the beauty of he is. And then how do we worship? Paul says this. Let your bodies be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind that he will find acceptable. How we worship, it's so simple. We give him all that we are by sacrificing everything we have. And we live our lives to bring light and we, bring our, we live our lives to bring glory to God, not glory to me. You know, worship isn't about music. Like, it's a part of it, a big part of it. How we do it corporately often is through music and song. But do you know other ways we worship? Sometimes it's saying no to the wrong thing so you can say yes to the right thing. So that way you can be a light in your workplace. You can be a light in your community. You can be a light wherever you go. Sometimes that's the truest form of worship is living our lives with God as the center. As holy and blameless in his eyes through the lens of Jesus. Because you know what? We're not, we're not holy and blameless on our own. We are broken, hurting people. But we become holy and blameless when Jesus went to the cross, God sees us, the Father sees us through the lens of Jesus and now we can live this holy and blameless space where God sees us that way. And it's powerful. So that's how Paul explained worship. You know, true and holy, you know, sacrifice, giving your lives as a sacrifice and that's how we do it. But I wanna go through how Jesus talked about worship and in the context where he explained this, and it's quite a long story, and I'm sure maybe you've heard it before. It's a really powerful story, and there's so much in this, but John 4, verse 11 to 24 says this. This is when Jesus is at the well. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Like, this is the context of, like, she's, she's like, I'm, he's like, I'm thirsty. She's like, I don't want to get you water. Like, you don't have a bucket. And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a flesh, a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. <laughs> Please, sir, can I have some more? I'm just kidding. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. 
And then I'll never be thirsty again. And then I won't have to come back to the well to get water. It's exhausting. It's hot. I don't want to come back. And then Jesus says, go get your husband. Odd thing to say. And she goes, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. This is, my, this is my favorite part. She just changes the subject immediately, which I get. Like, it's kind of awkward, right? She's like, sir, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at our mountain where our ancestors worship? That's a completely different topic. You've had five husbands. She's like, yeah. Next, right? Like, let me ask you my most theological question I have, right? Sometimes we do that to God too. He's like, you need to change. He's like, but God, what about, what about this? That's, that's, this story is hilarious to me. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. Well, we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed. It's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So this is when Jesus talks about the context of worship. And the question she goes to, to Jesus with is, Pretty big question is, why do you, do you say you can worship here and we say we can only worship here? Why? He's like, one day. And then he even says, it's actually here now. It will not matter where you worship. Right? It doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem. And if it did, we'd be in trouble because we're not in Jerusalem right now. I've never been to Jerusalem. It's a dream of mine. I'd love to go. But he's saying, no, it doesn't matter the location. What matters is how you approach the Father. How we approach God when it comes to worship. And then Jesus also shares two postures. He says, how do you approach the Father in worship? How do you worship? In spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. It's interesting because he says, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. So they didn't fully understand the truth of it, but they were worshiping in spirit. Whereas the Jews, they knew everything. They knew it all. And they were worshiping oftentimes more in the truth than they were worshiping in spirit. So Jesus says it's time to start worshiping in spirit and in truth. So how do we worship in spirit? Really, this is what Paul said. We present ourselves. Every aspect of our being is being presented as a holy sacrifice. Every part of our essence is focused on bringing glory to our God and blessing his holy name and giving him all that we are and all that we have. See, worship is not about production. Worship is not about having incredible musicians. Worship is not about even singing on key. It's not about the tech. It's not about it all. What it's about is him. I think we've got so caught up that we can only have an incredible worship experience when everything is perfect. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to find it. Have you ever tried to read your Bible at your home with a young child running around? It's not perfect. It's noisy. And some of us, we think, oh, I can't read my Bible. I can't pray. I can't worship today. I'm so busy. My kids are tired. God's like, can you just give me like a minute? You've been complaining longer than you've had time for to worship me. It's not about production. It's not about good lighting or good music. It's a posture of our entire being to worshiping our king. It can't be all formalistic. It can't be mechanical. I think it has to be a real authentic expression of our love and devotion to our incredible God. That's what worship is in spirit. 
We come to him in our weakness and we come to him in our pain and we come to him in our brokenness and we still declare his goodness over our life and over our province. What worship does is it really changes our focus, right? We spend so much time focused on all the things we have to do. And sometimes we just put worship or prayer or the Bible on a checklist. It's like, I have to do this or else I might not make it to heaven, you know? If I don't do this, then I don't know, maybe I won't get the promotion. If I don't read my Bible, maybe I'll fall back into sin. It's like, it's so much more than that. It's about loving and worshiping our Father. Declare his goodness and know his promises. And we declare that. That's how we worship, I believe, in spirit. And how do we worship in truth? Very interesting. We worship God with the understanding of who he is and what he has done. Like Paul talked about, right, when we read? Because of all he's done. We see this in Colossians, right? Colossians 3.16. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom, the truth, that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. The wisdom he has is the message about Christ. You know, the more we know about God, the more we can worship him in truth. There's so much power in the truth. And Jesus explained this so well in John chapter 8. And this verse gets taken out of context so much. This is what it says. Jesus... Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, we often hear the back part of that, the truth will set you free, but how? When we know it. When we know the truth. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? They don't understand Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not, more, not a permanent member of the family, but a son, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. We worship God in the context of knowing that he has set us free from all of it. We say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for it all. Now I'm gonna invite up uh, Micah. You know, the truth will set you free. I, I truly believe this. But only when you remain in his teachings. And when we remain in him and worship him, then we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. You know, we're gonna you know, do things maybe a little different today, but we're gonna close our service today in worship. Um, we're gonna, you know, spend, you know, the next maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes in adoration and worshiping the king. I want to encourage you that the next few moments as we worship, we worship him because of what he's done and we give him all that we are. And this might come as a confession of the things that, you, that in your life that you need to let go of. It might come from a place of gratitude, a thankful heart and saying, God, thank you for all the blessings I have in my life. It might be just a moment of sitting and finally putting your phone away, putting, around, putting aside the distraction and just listening to what God might be speaking to you today. I wanna encourage you, this moment is not about the production. It's not about any of it. It's just a moment that we wanna create space for you to have an intimate moment with God. Because we worship him in spirit and in truth. He is good. He is amazing. So let us honor and bless him today. So I'm gonna pray. And then, you know, we're just gonna have it kind of dark in here in just a moment for you to worship. I wanna encourage you, you know, do what you need to do. You don't need to stand, whatever you need to do. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. God, I thank you that you are moving. God, we thank you for everything that you've done in our life. God, we thank you that you are powerful and mighty and beautiful. And God, today we just go back to a place of the basics of worship. 
We put aside the distraction. We put aside everything going on and we just shift our eyes and we shift our focus to you today as our Lord. That we just worship you in spirit and in truth today. God, you are good. You are amazing. And so God, I pray that you speak to us individually over the next few moments. In Jesus' name.